Page 1.4 contains a listing of accounts in the asset, liability, accrual, and capital sections. Can you see those individual accounts listed there? It's really a fairly complete list, surprisingly. A lot of people think it should be longer, but the reason why many companies have longer accounts is because they have multiple bank accounts and multiple receivable accounts and so forth. So this is a, a good listing to begin with. And what we're going to do is we're going to go down each of these accounts and understand their purpose. Now, some of them are very generic accounts. Some of them are highly specialized. And so what, what you know what I mean by generic? Generic means they can be used in virtually any industry, okay? Like the bank account is a generic account. Anybody might have a bank account, okay? But some of the other accounts aren't similar to that. Now, let's start with the first account up there, which is the petty cash account. Now, what it is, petty cash is typically a box, maybe a metal box with a certain amount of cash in it, 100, 200, maybe $1,000, depending upon the company's needs. And it's green cash and coin, right? And so if you want to send somebody to, po to go get some postage, you just hand them a $20 bill and then ask them to bring back the change and a copy of the invoice, you know, so that you can support where that money went to. And so they might bring back a bunch of stamps and 20 cents in change and an invoice for $19.80, okay? And that's the process of the petty cash. Now, that is the most common example and use of petty cash. And most companies are going to have some system like that. At least they should, okay? Sometimes that's one of the first things we do is get them set up in a petty cash because you might have an owner that is just pulling money out of his pocket or her pocket or purse or whatever and buying these stamps and never making a record of it anywhere. Is that a problem? You bet it is, because at the end of the year, they're not, they're not going to have a full accounting of all their costs of doing business. And so a petty cash account is important to get them started with right away for their own benefit. Okay? Now, that's, only, that's the most common, but there are other uses of the petty cash account. Because the definition of petty cash is cash that you do not intend to deposit. Cash that you don't plan on depositing. Now, certainly the example that Mary Ann gave is an example of that, isn't it? I mean, that $100 or $200 is never going to be deposited. It's going to be left in that box until it's used up, and then it will be refurbished and so forth, okay? So that's one example. Can you, can you think of any other examples where you might have cash in the business that you're not going to deposit? There's one second that's fairly very common. Any of you ever worked with cash registers? Oh, yeah. Huh? Yeah. What happens? Every night we count out, that we take the cash out, and we put back a certain sum that we're going to use for change for tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. And that $100 or $200 that is in there every single morning is also petty cash because it's never going to be deposited. Do you follow that? Okay. So that's... That's an example of petty cash. Sometimes we call that cash in drawers, but it, it actually fits in the family of petty cash. Okay? Another common example is truck drivers carry an emergency fund in the cab of their truck. In case they're out in the middle of nowhere, they break down and need some cash to pay for somebody to come help them get out of their problem. Okay? So they might carry three or $400 in the cab. That's petty cash. Okay? They might call it an emergency fund. So petty cash is very common, and it's something we need to account for because that is money that we own. It's our money in the business. Okay? Let's look at the next account down there. It's called bank account. Now, I've got two bank accounts. One's just a general, and the other one's a payroll. And this is very common for businesses to have a separate checking account just for payroll. When we get into payroll, you'll understand why that is. But as far as the bank's concerned, there's really no distinction between those two accounts. All they know is that the same company has two separate checking accounts, okay? We're going to carry them separately because they have different balances. Now, we like banks. Banks are our friend, and I'll tell you why. If it wasn't for checking accounts, this would be a major problem for us. 
I have got some friends up in, not too far from here, a couple hours drive from here, that own a farm. These two gentlemen are brothers. They run this farm single-handedly, and for their entire adult life, they have never had a bank account, checking account. They've never trusted banks because they had a problem in their late teens that caused them to never have a bank account after that. They run a huge ranch farm and probably have millions and millions of dollars after years of running this farm. Now, if they don't have a bank account, where are they putting those millions and millions of dollars? Someplace. <laughs> and obviously they haven't shared that with us. I'll tell you one story that I wouldn't be surprised about um, that's, very, that's not that uncommon among some farmers that in order to keep track of their wealth, their system that they've set up, if they don't have a bank account, is to count out a certain sum, put it into a coffee can, so that each coffee can has the same amount of money, and bury it at the base of a fence post. And when you see a new line of fence going up, it's a deposit. And if you see a line of fence coming down, they're making a withdrawal. Okay? And so as their accountant, you're out there counting fence posts to determine what their wealth is. That's not an easy job. Okay? And the, pro the fact is, trying to keep track of these transactions, if they don't, have a bank account can be a real problem because you have to practically follow them around. I mean, a few years ago, they went and bought a combine. You know how much a combine is? A lot of money. Yeah, it depends, but this was over $100,000. And how did they pay for it? Cash. <laughs> and there was probably a little bit of dirt mixed in there because they hadn't gotten all cleaned out of the coffee can. I don't know, but they had... They probably walked in, and not knowing these guys, they probably put it into a McDonald's hamburger bag <laughs> and walked in carrying 100000 plus in cash into this store to buy that combine. You can bet there was a very surprised salesman there, very grateful salesman, okay? <laughs> so recognize that banks are our friend because they create documentation. Those checks are are a trail for us that we can track where the money went to and the deposits give us information as to where money came from. And so we like banks. And we encourage our businesses to run all their transactions through the bank account. Don't take money from a, from a customer and then pay it to somebody else unless you've made a record someplace that that's happened. Unfortunately, some businesses do run out of their pockets and we have to kind of correct that problem as soon as we get them. Is that right, Lori? Have you run into businesses like that that do take money out of their pocket and hand it out? And unless you get, you get on top of that, it can be a real problem. So we, should, we help them keep on top of that. Okay? Okay. The next account down in our list is cash on hand. The cash on hand account looks very similar to the petty cash. What was the petty cash? Cash that we're not going to deposit. Cash on hand is money we do intend to deposit. Okay? So what happens is at the beginning of the day, we've got $200 in the cash drawer to make change with, right? What do we call that money, that $200? What's it called? Petty cash. Now, customer walks in, hands us a $100 bill to pay for a service, and now we have $300 in that cash drawer, right? Where's that $100? Is that $100 later going to be deposited? So that goes into cash on hand. Throughout the day, we collect more and more money from our customers. At the end of the day, in the cash drawer, there's $1,000. What does that $1,000 consist of? $200 petty cash, $800 cash on hand. How much is our deposit going to be? $800. At that point, cash on hand goes down to zero, and the bank account goes up by $800. So if we make a deposit every night, what's going to be the balance in cash on hand every night? Zero, right? Petty cash will be whatever it is, $200. Cash on hand will be zero. But oftentimes businesses that might not have a lot of activity in their cash account might build up throughout the week, maybe even throughout the month. And they might just keep putting more money, more money, more money into cash on hand. And then maybe on Friday when they make their deposit, 
that's when it will go to zero and the bank account will go up by the amount of the deposit. Do you see that? So the ba balancing cash on hand, in most cases, is going to be zero after you make a deposit, unless you're holding on to a check for a customer or something like that. Okay? Most commonly, it's going to be zero. Okay. The next account down there is credit card vouchers. So far, all the accounts that we've talked about are very common accounts. And credit card vouchers used to be a very common account. Years ago, when we would accept credit cards, we would run it through an imprinter. Do you remember what those look like? Okay. There would be three copies on that voucher. One copy would go to the customer. Another copy would be an office copy that we would keep internally. And the third copy would be sent to MasterCard, American Express, Visa, or Novus. It would be actually, in, in, in many businesses, would actually mail it out to them. Okay? Now, it might take a week to get from the office to their office. And then it would take another week or so to process it through their MasterCard or whatever the credit card company system is. And then they would print a check and mail it back to us. Do any of you remember that process? Yeah. And it was, it was sometimes three or four weeks to go through that. Now, the more hands that get involved with the process and the longer the process takes, the more likely there are going to be errors or mistakes or something gets lost, okay? And so because of that extra time, we had a special account just for credit card vouchers to track those through the system. Now today, most companies use electronic means to process credit cards. They have, you know, a slider system or something like that. And usually when they use that system, a credit card is processed within 24 hours. That's even faster than processing a check. And so for that reason, we typically today put credit card vouchers in with our cash on hand account, just like we do checks. However, you will run out, run into businesses from time to time that still use the old imprinter system and still send it in to the credit card companies. In that case, you're going to have, want to have a credit card vouchers account, just like the one we've been talking about. So although it could exist in any industry, it's just not very common because it's somewhat obsolete these days. Okay? Now, the next account down there is a specialty account. These five accounts were generic because they could apply to any industry, but contracts in transit doesn't apply to just any industry. It's highly specialized. Within the industry it works with, it's very common. Let me just show you, by example, what a contracts in transit does. How many of you have bought a car before and signed the finance papers at the dealership but ended up paying a bank or finance companies in the process? Can I see? Many of you have, okay? Now, when you've done that, there's been some things that have been happening in the background that you might not be aware of. You, for instance, will fight, get the contract, you'll sign it down at the bottom, you hand it off to the dealer or to the salesman, right? Now, between the time that you did that and you made your first payment, the dealer took that contract and sold it to the bank or finance company. Actually sold it to them, okay? So let's imagine, for instance, that... Uh, I'll just use you as an example, Jara. You signed that contract, and I now have a piece of paper. Instead, in, in return, I give you a car, okay? That car used to be my asset. Now it's your asset, and I got a piece of paper in return. But that piece of paper is worth a certain amount. We call that a face value. Okay? Now, I take that piece of paper over to Joanne. She works in a bank, and she's one of the loan people in there. And I say, Joanne, do you want this piece of paper? What do you think the bank's going to say? Yeah, you bet. That's how the bank makes their money, is by making loans. So I say, Joanne, I would be more than happy to give you this piece of paper, but you've got to give me the amount that's shown here under face value. And let's just imagine that's $20,000, okay? So I give you the piece of paper. I pick up a check for $20,000. What am I going to do with this check from Joanne for $20,000? Give it to 
I mean a deposit in the checking account, right? Okay. That was a process. I sold the loan, Jared's loan, to Joanne. Okay? And I got the money in return. Now, Joanne, you're now from here on out, you're working with Jared to get that money collected. Okay? Happens every day in many different industries. The car automobile industry is only one of them. But you might have it happen in could it happen in jewelry stores? Could it happen in appliance stores? Computer stores? Many services, roofing industry, a lot of different services do the same thing, okay? Because they need to have the cash now. They can't wait until Jared pays it because they don't have enough cash in the bank to cover waiting for Jared to, or, or whoever the customer is to make all their payments. Whereas Joanne's got all the money, so she's the one that we're going to get it from, okay? Can you, could you use contracts in, in, in transit in any business? 7-Eleven doesn't need a contracts and transit account. I've tried to put that hot dog and Coke on a 12-month financing for years, and they won't do it, okay? Because they expect you got the cash. It's going to be in businesses where they sell items at a high price. So contracts and transit is the asset account that carries that contract from the time that the customer signs it to the time that the bank or finance company buys it. How long do you think that takes in most cases? 15 minutes. Yeah. It can take as short as 15 minutes. It's usually about a day or two. Okay? So it doesn't need to take very long at all. But we've got to have something to capture that, carry that, or list and control that account until we get it to the bank. Okay? So it's a very important purpose. But it's only going to be in certain industries. Car industry is where it's very commonly used used in virtually every car dealership. Okay, um, accounts receivable is listed as two separate accounts. You have the first accounts receivable, which is traditionally customer accounts receivable, and then you have employee accounts receivable. Now the reason why we break those out is because of the way we collect the money from the various parties. How do we collect the money from our customers? We send them statements, right? Okay? We print out a statement every month and mail it out to them. How do we collect the money from our employees? We, draw from their paycheck. we take it from their paycheck. Okay? We don't send out statements to them. We don't need to. We just take it out of their account. Okay? So we have two separate accounts so that we're only printing statements out on those that we're going to send out. We don't worry about statements on the employees. Very practical reason for having two separate receivable accounts. In both cases, we will keep track of the individual people. We might have a subsidiary ledger on each of those. One that says employee accounts receivable, the other one that says customer accounts receivable. So that we can keep track of it by name. Okay? Okay. Then we have inventory. Now, inventory is oftentimes misunderstood and abused. Okay? Inventory is an asset account that represents the cost of items that you intend to resell. Now, those two key words are important. And you'll see people put stuff into inventory that really isn't inventory. First of all, let's talk about cost. If I buy, if I sell clothing, and I buy a shirt for $10 that I intend to sell for $20, how much am I going to list it in the inventory account for? The 10 the cost, not how much I plan on selling it for. I don't recognize how much I'm going to sell it for until I sell it. And then there's a different account that I put that in. Okay? So it's just the cost of the items. And then the real key word is resell. It is items that we intend to sell to somebody else. One of our students just a couple days ago called me up. And she's working with a company that every year at the end of the year goes out and does an inventory of all their staplers, all their boxes of staples, all their ink cartridges, all their pens. And not only is that a waste of time, 
keeping track of that. But that's not inventory. They're not selling those things. They're using those things. Okay? Now, the reason why they do it is because they want to build up their assets. They want to have a whole bunch of assets. But that's not appropriate nor necessary to go through that effort. Inventory is only things that we need to, we're going to resell. Will every company have an inventory account? Why not? They're service oriented. They don't buy items to sell. They provide a service. You know, several of you have talked about doing freelancing. Will you have inventory in freelancing? No. no. Not unless you're selling some herbs to your clients too on the side as part of your accounting service. Okay? <laughs> which is not traditional or typical, okay? So I'm not recommending that, but we typically in an accounting business don't have an inventory because we aren't buying things with the intention of reselling them. Now, we of course have paper and pencils and pens and all those things that come in the office. Those are supplies, not inventory, okay? Okay, so that's, that's the inventory account. Prepaid accounts are the next two accounts. We've got prepaid rent and prepaid deposits. Prepaid rent, or any prepaid item, is something that we paid with the anticipation that we're going to get it back at some point in the future. You've all, pay, you've all got prepaid items probably personally, okay? If you made a deposit to the utility company when you signed up for utilities personally, that was a prepaid item. Do you expect or hope to get that money back at some point in the future? Certainly, yeah. And it might be. It might be. Sorola says when she dies. It might be when you die, okay, if you keep the same company forever and ever. But if you were to move, you would expect to get it back, wouldn't you? Okay? And the same thing happens in businesses. We get charged. Now, we also get, as, as well, just like you do personally, if we rent an office building, the landlord always it seems, asks for the first and last month's rent, don't they? Isn't that pretty traditional? Plus the cleaning deposit. What's that? Plus the cleaning well, the cleaning deposit is what we're talking about here, and typically that's the last month's rent. Now, sometimes they'll ask for a little bit more, especially if you have pets or something like that. They might ask for a premium on that. But, but that last month's rent, you expect to either get that back at the, you know, when you leave the lease or get it applied as the last month. So you haven't used it until that occurs. In the meantime, that's called a prepaid rent deposit. And we keep it on the books. Every month or every year, the newspaper publishes a list of unclaimed funds. Have you ever seen that list? It is, I mean, it's getting quite thick, isn't it? Okay, it just came out here a few weeks ago. And that list describes all these people's names, and ha it doesn't tell you how much, it just says the name, okay? And so if you're like most people, you sit down with that, and you look to see, first of all, is your own name on there, okay? Because these are monies that are sitting there waiting for you to claim them, or you're looking for relatives or businesses' monies and so forth. Well, a lot of the reasons why there's money that's unclaimed is because someone moved and forgot that they had put a deposit in on something. And now the insurance company or the whoever, you know, the utility company sends that money to the home address. There's no forwarding address. They get it back. What do they do with it? They have to send it into the state. At least they're legally supposed to do that. Send it into the state. The state takes responsibility for it and adds it to that unclaimed funds list. Okay? So if you're not keeping track of that, it could be that someday you'll end up on that list. And that's very often where those people come from. Okay? So any deposit that you pay that you intend to receive back at some point in the future. Notes receivable. Notes receivable and accounts receivable both represent monies that customers owe to us. The difference is notes receivable are interest-bearing. Accounts receivable are not. Accounts receivable, which is the most common of the two, is those 30, 60, 90 day accounts that a store makes with their most common customers, the regular customers. And they say in that, if you pay me in 30 days or 60 days or 90 days, whatever the terms are, then they're pay me the same as cash. You don't have to pay me any interest. Okay? 
Notes receivable, on the other hand, says, and usually it's a longer term, uh, I'll sell you this, but you have to promise to pay me a certain amount every month for the next year or two years or five years, whatever it is, okay? And so there's usually an interest embedded in those payments, isn't there? Accounts receivable, non-interest bearing. Notes receivable, interest bearing. Which one's the most common between those two? Accounts receivable. Accounts receivable. Accounts receivable by far. Now, one thing that happens is what if a customer doesn't pay you within the 30 days or the prescribed terms? Can you charge them interest then? But that's a penalty interest or service charge. You do not reallocate them down to notes receivable. You leave them in accounts receivable, even though there might be some interest that's been added to it. It's the original intent that makes the difference between accounts receivable and notes receivable. If the original intent was to make payments with interest, it's a notes receivable. Okay? Now, in banks, that's a very common practice. Notes receivable is their biggest item. They don't have any much to speak of when it comes to accounts receivable. Okay? It's notes receivable. Okay, and the final account in that first section is called the bank reserve account. The bank reserve account is another specialty account. It belongs to businesses that sell contracts. You might recall our experience where Jer signed a contract. I sold it to Joanne, the banker, the loan person. Okay? Now, Joanne, do you want me to bring all my contracts to you as the dealer? Would you like me to bring them all? Yeah, sure. Okay? I'm going to bring her a whole bunch of money in business if I bring her all my contracts. So... In order to encourage me to bring all the contracts to her, Joanne gives me a commission or a finder's fee or, or whatever, if you will. This is very common. And what she does is instead of giving it to me, she, she puts it into an account in the bank that has my name on it. It's, it's my account. The money she's putting in there is my money. The problem is... For new businesses particularly, Joanne retains all control. The bank keeps control of that account. I can't withdraw money from it. I can't take it out of there. It's my money. I just have no way of writing a check or withdrawing it. In order to get that money out, I have to go to the banker, the loan officer, or Joanne in this case, and say, Joanne, um, could you look at that account? Because I think that there's more in there than you, than you need. Because they're going to keep that account on a reserve against future losses. What happens if Jera goes, drives the car home, and then a couple weeks later her rich uncle dies and she inherits $5 million? What's she going to do? Yeah. Going to pay off that loan, right? Well, that commission that the bank gave me was based on the expected interest that they're going to earn. If the customer pays it off early, the bank's not going to earn that commission, are they? Or, excuse me, the bank's not going to earn that interest. And so what do you think they're going to do to my bank reserve account? Take, Take part of it back, okay? Most of it back. So if, if the bank had given me the access to that account, what would I have probably done? Take it all out and put it in my operating account, right? Get it out of their control. But they know that they can't do that because they have to maintain the reserve against future losses. See, I might bring another customer to the bank and say, um, you know, here's a great contract. Give me the money. They, they give us the money, and then the next month we never see that, con that the customer never makes a payment. So the bank goes and repossesses the car, sells it in an auto auction, and sells it for less than what they loan me the money for. Where do you think they're going to get the difference? That bank reserve account. Yeah, they're going to go withdraw it from that. So that you see how that reserve account is used for future losses, okay? Now, after it builds up and builds up, at some point they're going to say, yeah, we've got more than we need in there to protect ourselves. So at that point they'll start doling some of it out to us. They'll hand us, you know, some of the money, send us a check, take it out of there, and we can deposit that in our operating account. But in the meantime, until they're ready to give it out to us, they're going to keep control of that money, okay? Now, where, where can bank reserve accounts work? Are you going to have those with every business? No. What kind of businesses are you going to have those with? Car dealerships, what else? Mortgage. Mortgage, 
Okay, mortgage companies, they have a similar, it's a little bit different, but it, it, there's some similarities there. What else? Any business that has high contracts. Okay, any business that sells expensive merchandise. Can you have a jewelry business, mm -hmm. appliance business, motor home, boats, snowmobiles, motorcycles? All those are different businesses that likely will have a bank reserve account. Okay? Okay, now these accounts that we've dealt with so far are called current assets. Assets are, by definition, assets that are either cash now or you expect will become cash in the next year, the next 12 months. Okay? Now, petty cash, for instance, that's cash now. Obviously qualifies as a current asset. Then you've got bank account. Well, that's as close to cash as we can get it, short of having the green cash and coin. You've got cash on hand. All those are good examples. What about uh, accounts receivable? Mm -hmm. Why? Because you're expecting the money within 30 to 90 days. We expect to get it, okay? We expect that money, okay? Mm -hmm. What about uh, inventory? And you're expecting to sell your merchandise. We sure hope we're going to sell that in the next 12 months, right? Now, is there a chance that some of the things... We won't sell in the next 12 months. Jackie, you think we'll, there's a chance we might still have some of that stuff 12 months from now? Sure. Okay. And, and, uh, but the nature of it was we intended to sell it. If we didn't intend to sell it in the next 12 months, we probably shouldn't have bought it. Okay. So inventory by its nature is an account, is a current asset. 